Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining this fireside chat. My name is Carlos Gradin. I'm a research fellow at UNIWIDER in Helsinki, where I work on various research topics around inequality. And I'm here today to have a chat with Anda David, uh, who is joining us from Johannesburg in South Africa. She's an economist in charge of the research programs on inequality, poverty, and international migration at AFD, the French Agency for Development. She also coordinates the scientific aspects of the European Research Facility on Inequalities in partnership with the European Commission's Director General for International Partnerships. We are here today to chat about the challenges of inequality and climate change in the context of the COVID. So this is an informal session. Please feel free to participate in the discussion. You can use write uh, your questions in the Q&A, uh, in the session uh, Q&A, or you can request to be on stage and share your audio and video and address your question directly. So under uh, COVID is putting under great pressure the labor markets everywhere, right? Particularly in developing countries. And it's also putting under pressure the fragile social protection system. So we've seen a lot of evidence of this during the conference. As such, it will exacerbate existing inequalities at a time when these countries will also be facing other big challenges, you know, more structural or long term uh, challenges like the effects of climate change. What do you think should be the priorities of public policies in this context? Thank you so much, Carlos. And just to say that it's it's great to be here in this really impressive conference. Um, and it's true that what we see in the conference also uh, is this this issue of uh, increasing challenges, both regarding um, social protection, but also when, when we look at other aspects. So one thing that uh, we are trying to, to, to work a little bit around is the fact, and I think we all agree that inequalities and climate change are strongly linked. And therefore, it's essential to, be, to put both of these issues uh, at the core of recovery strategies. Now, already before COVID, we had lots of signals that social issues uh, aren't to be left on a secondary place uh, when we act to curb climate change or mitigate its consequences. I think that the yellow vest movements we saw in France, for instance, was just a glimpse of what's happening globally. Now that we see that states have been faced with the challenges of the pandemic, uh, it's time to rethink recovery strategies, keeping in mind also what went wrong in the past and what were the drivers. So a first step is to think about what is the long-term strategy, what is the kind of society that we want to live in, and how can the urgent actions that need to be taken now can be articulated with, the, with this long-term strategy. Yes, companies need to be supported in order to survive lockdowns, but this support needs also to be sought in relationship with the long-term goals, such as reducing the, um, the carbon footprints of companies. Vulnerable households need to be supported with emergency grants, for instance, as was the case in South Africa. But again, the long-term objective should be a universal social protection system. So one of the priorities should be the sort of renewed social contract, which not only allows for a social minimum for everyone, but also a renewed uh, sense of solidarity for, uh, for societies. Uh, more crises are coming due to climate change, and societies which are more cohesive will also be more resilient. Now, another uh, priority should also be the strengthening of states' capacities, not only to design, but especially to implement policies. What we have seen with the current crisis is that states have lost uh, very often the capacity to plan, and this is something that we need to, to invest in. And in order to, to invest in this and also to, to better understand the intersections between inequalities and climate change, we need more research, we need more data. And this is also one of the reasons why uh, both on the IFD and the EU side and lots of other donors are investing in 
in research programs such as the, the EUIFD Research Facility uh, for Inequalities. So I know if this response to... Yeah, for sure. Yes, a uh, quick reminder for our uh, for the audience that you can address questions either through the Q&A or requesting directly to um, participate in, in, in the discussion live. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I, because uh, <laughs> I also wanted to ask you a question on this, because sure. I know that you guys at UNU Wider have a lot of experience on running policy dialogues. And I think that one question that comes up when we think about how to support the states in, in these challenges is also to identify which would be the most effective ways of engaging governments on topics such as inequalities and, and climate change. Yeah, I mean, sure, you know, Wider has done an important effort uh, in developing partnerships in various developing countries uh, uh, so far. Uh, I'm not directly involved with most of them, but as an observer, I, I would say that I think it's very important to build uh, mutual trust among all partner institutions involved in these dialogues and engage in a very inclusive uh, dialogue with all possible stakeholders involve policymakers, sometimes maybe fiscal authorities. Uh, if you mentioned that you need data, you should involve statistical offices, uh, research institutions or universities that, are, that could provide you also a lot of context uh, uh, around the country. Uh, you need to listen to the civil society, like uh, NGOs or other uh, organizations that could be uh, interested and involved and could give you a better idea what is uh, going on. I think in, in the case of the climate change, as you mentioned, can be especially challenging because uh, we know that some measures, for example, that help to fight climate change may be unpopular no? uh, if they are not handled well. Like in France, you mentioned your experience with the uh, yellow vest. No? Uh, for example, because they can increase the price of energy or introduce restrictions on uh, farming or uh, but at the same time, they can also create opportunities to mobilize resources, for example, that can be used to improve the situation of the most uh, vulnerable. So I think, in general, that is very, very important to continuously listen to civil society, uh, their needs. There should be a very south-to-south -south dialogue. So probably imposing magic recipes designed in uh, the north, you know, in any uh, office, very well-intentioned, maybe very technical, um, uh, uh, very effective, but then uh, they don't work in, in, in out of context. Uh, well, uh, continue. I mean, with what we are discussing here, uh, you have a, um, a someone who is working you know, at the core of the European Development Aid. Uh, how do you think that official aid can help developing countries fighting these old and new economic inequalities? Uh, including the effects of the pandemic, but also the more long-term uh, consequence of uh, climate change. And maybe you can give us some specific actions or policies that uh, the research facilities on inequality are trying to implement. Indeed, um, as you mentioned, it's um, it's a very challenging question also because, uh, for instance, the issue of inequality and most more precisely income inequality, it's something that's quite new for the development world. Uh, before the, the SDGs, it was, there wasn't any mandate for, for development institutions to, to work on this issue. So engaging with, with partner countries on, on this topic, it's, it's not always easy. Um, and it's also not always, a, I would say, a, a, the, the, the easiest task for, for us. So one of the things on which we're working, and again, it links a little bit to, to what you were saying, is uh, the promotion of policy dialogues on the issue of inequality and climate change, uh, mostly based on uh, local research and, and making partnerships with local institutions. Um, I think that one of the, the crucial points for, for aid in general uh, in the next years is, again, to, to, to step aside from this Norton perspective uh, and to trust more local institutions. Um, 
one of the tools, for instance, that states have to invest and in, in, in that can be used uh, are the, the national development banks. They need to be more mobilized in the recovery um, and to, to be involved uh, in the development of the countries. And for the last couple of years, uh, they weren't that much part of the conversation. Now, I think there's also an issue, an issue of being more committed actually to both climate change and inequality reduction. What we see, for instance, in, in IFD, is that we very often have either projects on, uh, inequ on reducing inequality of access, for instance, or poverty reduction, and projects on climate change. And it's often difficult to make the bridge between the two uh, at the operational level and also in terms of policy dialogue. One of the tools that, that we we're starting to work with are sort of um, strategic memorandums of dialogue with partner countries in which we sit down with them and we decide on which should be the priorities in terms of, res of applied research, um, both on climate change and on the social aspects, specifically inequality reduction. And then together we decide on which should be the, the research projects that then we we implement together. So this is also what we've done in, in the facility. We've worked, for instance, in uh, Tunisia and Morocco and also in, in Ivory Coast, both on issues of how do we tackle specifically spatial inequality and inequality of opportunity, how do we tackle climate change? And now we're trying to see how we can move this together. Now, I was wondering, I mean, because the first phase of this uh, program was basically research no? in specific uh, countries. And I'm wondering, I mean, is there, a, do you see a big gap between this more academic oriented research and the next step that you are trying to do that is mobilizing you know, the society, the policy dialogue to implement specific policies that can uh, have actual effect on people's lives? Yes, and I have to say that this is also a part where we try to learn uh, a bit from, from Rian Wider on this, because what we are trying to do, in the, especially in the second part of the facility, which, which we are launching this year, is to specifically identify policy initiatives that can be supported through a little bit of research and then more policy dialogue and technical assistance if needed. So, for instance, in uh, the first phase of the facility, we've worked in uh, in Mexico on perceptions of inequality, on perceptions of the fiscal system, um, and then we sat down with with the with the government, specifically with the, with the previous minister of finances, uh, to think about how do we take this forward now. And we have identified two priorities for the government, which were also um, relevant for this facility. One, which is the role of uh, environmental taxation and how. The, how it can have a distributive effect and how it can also be shaped in order to, to improve its, its impacts on inequalities. And the other one is the care economy and the link with the, with the labor market. In South Africa, for instance, um, initially we, we wanted to, to work more on the gender aspects and the just transition. Now, uh, that those were discussions pre-COVID. So what we will be doing is working directly with the presidency in developing tools that can support their decision-making processes in implementing and assessing afterwards the, the employment stimulus that has, been, um, that has been set up in order to respond to the, the, to the COVID pandemic. Thank you very much. I think it's really a very uh, interesting uh, process. Uh, I agree that somehow it uh, relates to a part of the work uh, Uno Wider has been done uh, in, in several countries because it's like uh, building this bridge you know, between research that is, can be academic. And it's very interesting because it gives you uh, uh, empirical evidence, not well um, grounded empirical evidence to see, for example, what kind of policies work, what kind of mm. policies don't work in a specific context, or uh, identifying what are the, the most important um, needs in terms of poverty or inclusion, in terms of inequality, uh, even identifying maybe geographical areas that uh, need more attention. And at the same time, trying to uh, 
uh, mobilize you know, the, a policy dialogue around this to have an impact with sometimes the time is, uh, I mean, the, the, the way of working, of thinking can be very different you know, in, in the academic world and in, in the policy making uh, context. And uh, I wonder in these dialogues, what is the role of the civil society? So a part of having partnership, I would say with researchers, you know, research institutions, mm. or with the government and policymakers, is there, or oh, do you see any role for maybe NGOs or maybe international organizations based on those areas, but mainly local, no? I'm thinking in the local associations or uh, networks that could uh, help you identifying these policies or maybe identifying what kind of impact these policies could have that maybe is not directly expected from the theory, you know, from, from the empirical evidence in other mm. areas. Exactly. So what we, well, when we, we, we talk about social, uh, of, of our civil society, uh, usually the, the academia is part of the civil society, but we, we try to, to sort of uh, make sure that other types of civil society are represented. So um, we always have the, the sort of national dialogues that we also, it's easier when when uh, when there's no COVID, so we can have these national workshops in which we consult. We try to understand whether the the what we had in mind is relevant and whether uh, we should, for instance, uh, add act add, add actors in our to uh, our steering committees of projects. It's more difficult to do now with the webinars. So one thing that we are trying to do is also trying to um to ask the civil society to, to propose projects so in the case of south africa uh, of course we have our research, big research projects with uh, with the local universities but we've also launched a call for proposals for research proposals um together with the presidency in which we hope that smaller ngos that do a little bit of research or that don't do research but can get research partners could try to 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 support our thinking about okay how do we actually assess the impact of the employment stimulus what should we think about when trying to think about the longer term perspective of how how could uh, a stimulus be implemented what's needed as a social policy once the stimulus ends, et cetera. So we would also try to involve them beyond that. Then uh, as IFD, we also have call for uh, projects for the, the, the civil society as such. Um, but I think that they are crucial in, in thinking about a policy dialogue that's not just between researchers, uh, international institutions and, and the government. Hey, thank you. Since our audience is a, a bit shy in asking questions, I would try to think uh, the interest that people who want to follow up with this process, uh, what are the channels that they can participate or follow up uh, with uh, the developments? Uh, maybe I think in both people who could be interested in the specific countries that you are working, and maybe you can specify, you mentioned some of the countries, I'm not sure. It's all of them. Maybe you can specify what countries and also what, in general, what channels do you have to engage other people who would be interested in following up with this so interesting and promising uh, process? Yes. So uh, the, the four countries on which we will be focusing specifically in the second phase of the of the research facility. So we will be mixing uh, research and, and support a policy dialogue are uh, South Africa, uh, Indonesia, where we'll be specifically working on um, the link between equality and climate change and on how marine protected areas can, can impact inequality, both at the local and the national level. We'll be working in Colombia also, uh, more specifically on fiscal issues and um, uh, and global uh, inequality. We'll be working. We'll be conducting our inequality diagnostics there as well, and we'll be working in Mexico, uh, more precisely on, as we're saying, on the care economy and the environmental taxation. Now, in each country, um, we will have. Uh, workshops and um, 
and policy dialogues uh, at which we hope to see as many people as possible. I think that the best means to, to follow up on the projects is our webpage, uh, which I can also put in the chat. And uh, of course, contact. we have a global uh, address, with, which is the Research Facility Inequalities. I can also put that in the chat box. On Twitter, we have a hashtag, which is Research Inequalities, in plural. And normally, if you look at that, you can find information about all of our past work, um, where we worked in more than 20 countries across the globe on themes, uh, of course, always linked to inequality, but which range from uh, inequality in the labor market to inequality in access to, to water, inequality and, uh, and affordable housing, etc. Uh, so we can, you can find all of that. Of course, you can find it on our webpage and uh, you can always uh, send me an email. Uh, it's always a pleasure to 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 try to see which can be other collaborations uh, regarding research, regarding policy dialogue, uh, etc. And we have a broader program working on inequality and, and recovery. Uh, we also work in Southeast Asia. We work in Mali, Mozambique, etc. Hey, thank you very much. Link Andrei. in the chat. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting process, so people know how to follow up on that. And uh, yes, uh, thank you for being here, and please enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, thank you very much to everybody uh, who has participated in the, uh, in the chat. Thank you.